Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. This evening, we are joined by Dr. Patricia Lugar, who will be discussing how primary immunodeficiency can impact overall lung health and provide an update of the ongoing study into the use of abatacept for the treatment of interstitial lung disease associated with CVID. My name is Emma Mertens, and I'm the Program Manager of Community Health at the Immune Deficiency Foundation. On behalf of the Foundation, we thank you for tuning in. Tonight's webinar is one of many virtual education opportunities available in our 2023 programmatic lineup. We recognize that through the provision of timely, comprehensive, and accessible information, we can improve the diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life of people affected by primary immunodeficiency. We appreciate you being a part of this journey. Before we get started, I would like to point out a few tech pointers to keep in mind for tonight's program. This evening, we are using the Zoom webinar feature, and attendees should be able to see the slides and hear the presenter and host speak. Attendees will not be able to activate their video camera or their microphone. There will be the opportunity for questions after their presentation. You are welcome to submit any questions you have for Dr. Lugar as you think of them throughout the session. We kindly ask that questions are relevant to tonight's topic. Please type them once in the Q&A box in the control panel on your screen. Please do not include any personal health information as all questions will be anonymous and read aloud. A brief disclaimer. Please remember that information presented during this meeting is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. We are here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during an educational event. Be sure to check out our website at www.primaryimmune.org where you'll find resources, events, support services, and more. Everything is free to access and print. We can also help you find an immunologist or PI specialist in your area with the Clinician Finder. The Immune Deficiency Foundation hosts educational programming and events, including lunch and learns and webinars, which cover a variety of topics facing the PI community. We also offer Get Connected groups, peer support, Ask IDF, and an annual conference. This meeting is made possible by our wonderful sponsors. It is due to their partnerships and contributions that we can provide programs like this for the PI community. Please join me in thanking our 2023 sponsors. CSL Bearing, Griffles, Takeda, Octopharma, Farming Healthcare, and CVS Specialty Pharmacy. And now I am so pleased to introduce our presenter for this evening. Dr. Patricia Lugar is the Chief of Allergy and Immunology at the Duke Asthma Allergy and Airway Center and an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Lugar. Thank you, and thank you everyone for um, joining in on this talk. All right, well, yes, good evening, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Always happy to participate with the Immune Deficiency Foundation and everyone that's been able to join. I hope to talk, it's a big subject, um, PI and lung health, and so I hope to touch on a lot of what might be uh, on your mind as, as some key points to advance your health. Um, but there might be some things that I leave out, so hopefully we can address those in the questions. Okay. All right. Um, I do work with both Griffles as well as Blueprint Medicines on their Speakers Bureau and for Griffles as well on their Advisory Board. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about how lung health really fits into PI. And we know that when folks are on their journey to getting diagnosed with uh, a primary immune deficiency condition, oftentimes infection is going to be a big part of the symptoms. And number one is going to be respiratory tract. Behind that is GI. And then oftentimes patients might first be recognized as having abnormal blood counts, such as anemia or low platelet counts, particularly in adolescent or young adults. And that might lead them on the journey to getting discovered as a PI. But by far, the respiratory tract is a large focus where patients have symptoms. Now, respiratory symptoms are quite broad, um, but many patients will have recurrent symptoms, cough, shortness of breath, wheezing, chest pain. They may even have exercise limitations or poor exercise tolerance. They might have symptoms where they really can't exert themselves much, or if they do, they have this waxing, waning sort of uh, activity level. So if they do too much and then they're really fatigued after. Now, these are symptoms and they can have many underlying causes. When we're thinking about cough and wheezing and a lot of these respiratory symptoms, I like to break it up into two main aspects. And that's how I would like for you guys to think about this as well. And also as we're um, thinking about how our physicians, whether the primary care doctors or immunologists are thinking about these, we're trying to break them up in are some of these symptoms related to an infection or do we have a non-infectious cause for these symptoms? And that sometimes could be structural or inflammation. And so I'll spend some time talking about the first uh, area here, which is really infection, and then moving on over to non-infection. And so obviously upper respiratory tract infections, ear infections, tonsillitis, sinusitis, these are very, very common, and they can certainly lead to lower tract symptoms, such as cough, um, and wheezing or um, mucopyrrolin cough, such as bring, expectoration, bringing up a lot of mucus. And we see that that's, we're worried about bronchitis, we're worried about pneumonia, a complication of pneumonia or recurrent respiratory infections is empyema and bronchiectasis. On the non-infection side, structurally, we can see that these same symptoms can certainly be brought on by changes in the airway, such as an asthma-like picture, a fixed airway obstruction. We tend to think of that more like COPD or emphysema. There can be scarring or changes in the lung tissue uh, that would lead to um, changes in how we can exert ourselves and how well we can oxygenate our blood through our lungs. And um, this could be also due to either injury or injury from certain infections. Bronchiectasis, which we'll talk about is another structural change that happens in the lungs. And that certainly brings about a, a number of symptoms. Cystic lesions in certain PI conditions uh, are a worrisome complication. And then there's inflammation. Asthma is also in this category, as well as interstitial lung disease and granulomatous disease. Unfortunately, as well, cancer, there are particularly some uh, lymphomas uh, that can present in the airways of the lungs, and that can lead to symptoms as well as lung cancer due to um, what we call adenocarcinoma. So we're going to focus on the infections for a little bit. Um, obviously, um, this is a really nice picture that I stole from this publication that was recently uh, available to us in Jackie in Practice. And what I like about it is it does separate different types of infections, bacteria, viruses, uh, invasive fungi, and pneumocystis. Now we see mainly for folks that have an ant body deficiency or humoral defect, um, we're going to see more issues or recurrent infections with encapsulated bacteria. Some of the other PIs that might be associated with cellular defects, so maybe affecting the antibodies, but also our T cells, which is an important part of training our immune system, they're going to be more susceptible to certain respiratory viruses, herpes viruses, as well as pneumocystis, which is a very particular type of um, pathogen. 
And then uh, individuals that have CGD, for example, are going to be um, quite predisposed to infections with um, some certain fungi, including aspergillus. So it kind of depends on um, when the patient comes to us, the different types of infections that they've had. It makes us think about, well, these are some of the immune defects that I'm worried about. So people can certainly have one or more defects in their immune system, and that might be dictated by the types of infections that they have. So getting the data on what those infections are is always going to be helpful for us. So in thinking particularly about respiratory infections due to bacteria, uh, Streptococcus species are really important, Haemophilus species are important, Staph aureus, Mycoplasma, and Pseudomonas. Uh, those are very common bacterial pathogens that we will find in the upper and lower respiratory tract. And as far as those fungal species, um, that is Aspergillus and also Candida. A big part that I hope to really um, encourage everyone is how important it is for us to get culture data. It's really important. Ideally, we would like to get cultures anytime an infection is suspected. Now, this is very important because not only are, you know, the main uh, health concern that we have for our patients with PI is going to be infectious complications. We'll talk a little bit about if we don't manage these infections well because we're not picking the right antibiotics. We can run into some issues where we do get some uh, inflammatory changes in the lungs. So we really want to make sure that we are targeting as best as we can with our data from cultures. We also can run into situations where patients have had these infections again and again and again, and we want to treat them right away. However, if we might become suspicious that I think it's more inflammation than infection. And so when we're up against those decision points, we should be careful about giving antibiotics if really we're ignoring an inflammatory process that's brewing. So culture data is really important and really helps us um, validate how we're managing our patients and also uh, how to help our patients get the best care to make sure that we're paying attention to some of these other changes that could be happening in the lung. Well, how do we minimize infection? And I think about it really in three uh, steps or three areas. Now, certainly antibiotics or antimicrobials, which could include antifungals, are going to be an important part of how we reduce infections. Depending on the PI, we might do short-term antibiotic prophylaxis if that is appropriate at the time. Some patients may never have antimicrobial prophylaxis at all. Some PIs do require, from the best evidence we have, that if they stay on maintenance antimicrobial prophylaxis, that's going to be the best course of action for them. CGD might be an example, hyper IgE syndromes, for example, certain types of combined immune deficiency may also um, be best served by doing maintenance antibiotic prophylaxis or antifungal prophylaxis. There's a nice strategy called pill and pocket where sometimes we'll write prescriptions for patients so that they can keep it in their cupboard or keep it with them, particularly if they're going to be traveling. So if they do have symptoms of a typical infection um, that we're all aware of and we know they can't just go get a culture right away or uh, we know that symptoms can advance very quickly, we'd like for them to take an antibiotic quickly when they have symptoms and then let us know. And we can keep track of that and develop a strategy if we wanted to get cultures or if we wanted to do something differently. But sometimes that really helps really nip those symptoms in the bud so that we don't get a complicated infection. For patients with antibody deficiencies, certainly immunoglobulin replacement is key to minimizing infections. And I hope to show you soon that there is some evidence that by dosing immunoglobulin appropriately, there might be a optimal range at which we keep our patients so that they can reduce their infections. There is some individual um, recommendations person by person. However, we do have a guideline of where we're aiming. What would some of those, uh, what are some of those guidelines? And we'll talk about that very soon. And then lastly, every patient, um, you know, uh, 
that has had particularly recurrent airway infections, we want to make sure that we don't have any structural changes in the airway. This is easy to test for. Um, it does help us because we know that structural changes can occur if there's been a lot of respiratory infections and symptoms may be exacerbated if there already are some changes in the airway. And this might be airway obstruction. An example of that would be asthma or reactive airway uh, disease or like a post-infection uh, inflammation in the airways. Symptoms might manifest as an infection that comes on, maybe with some symptoms of fever and fatigue. There's a lot of coughing, maybe it's productive. They get the treatment that they need with appropriate antibiotics, but it just doesn't go away. They're feeling better, however, the cough is there and it won't go away. I'm just coughing, coughing, coughing. Well, that can mean that the infection has been treated. However, we have some ongoing inflammation because you know the immune system is trying to clear all that out. Everyone's pretty active in that space and it's irritating the tissue space. Uh, there's a lot of action there and it, it wants everyone to leave and that's causing some, some reactive changes. And so it's, it's important for us to know about that, if that's present or if that's part of your symptomatology, because then we're not gonna do antibiotics again, we're gonna focus on managing that part of the airway. I think it's also important too for patients, particularly if they do have that pattern, to say, okay, I'm gonna be treated for this sinusitis or this bronchitis, What's my step-up plan or my go-to approach so that I know at the start of these symptoms, I'm going to be having this prolonged cough or, or you know, whatever my symptoms are, and I don't want to go through that, so I'm going to step up therapy. I'm going to treat the inflammation as well as the infection, and oftentimes that can cut short the symptoms and also not set you up for an infection back-to-back. So I, I said we were going to talk a little bit about immunoglobulin replacement. There is a guideline that's been well established um, that really recommends we should probably maintain uh, patients who have an antibody deficiency and are on uh, antibody replacement or immunoglobulin replacement therapy, such as IVIG or subcutaneous IG. For those patients, we know that maintaining their immunoglobulin levels uh, at least 700. And this is 700 milligrams per deciliter. It might be written a little bit differently for you. Usually it's written as um, three to four digit numbers, just 100 to 1,000 or more. Um, some labs might just present it as grams per deciliter, and you might see it as single digits or double digits. But for most of us that are reporting it as milligrams per deciliter, 700 is the minimum recommended to maintain um, reasonable protection from infections. And this is not just any time of the day, it should be 700, we'll talk a little bit about this, but it at the trough. So whenever you're getting immunoglobulin replacement, those, there's that initial infusion of the immunoglobulin, and then the body will catabolize it which means it will process and destroy that immunoglobulin or that immunoglobulin might be taken up by our own immune cells. That effectively clears it from the bloodstream and it's not readily available to the immune system. Everyone has a different rate at which that happens. There are some features that we know some people might lower their levels a lot faster than other folks. And so at that process where that immunoglobulin is beginning to be cleared from the bloodstream, that's the trough. And the lowest point prior to the next dose of immunoglobulin is the trough really that this is talking about. And so we know that 700 is sort of the ultimate or starting point for a goal. Um, as we learn more and more and look at other publications, we can see that, for example, for pneumonia, if uh, the patient's levels are 500, there are five-fold more cases of pneumonia than a patient who has a trough IgG at maintained at 1,000. There was another study that looked at patients that have agamma globulinemia, and these are patients that have very low IgG 
naturally before replacement. And their annual incidence of bacterial infections that required hospitalization, which were ordinarily mainly pneumonia, was zero if their IgG trough was greater than 800. And we see that the infections that required hospitalization increased as the trough IgG was maintained in a lower range. So between 500 to 800 versus 500 or less. And so we can clearly see that the level of immunoglobulin in our patients we're replacing can be strongly correlated with how often they're experiencing infections. Lastly, I pulled this last number from a randomized trial looking at two IVIG products. And they noted that the incidence of validated infections, meaning proven by a chest X-ray or proven by cultures during maintenance IgG trough levels was that it was maintained at 900, was 13.6, increased as the trough IgG also went down. So 18.6 for 70 to 700 to 900. And again, 700 less was 20.9%. So a clear association with the trough IgG levels and keeping patients um, out of the hospital with respect to infections and potentially even infection free in some other data. In addition, higher IgG trough may aid airway management. We just talked a little bit about our airways and how important they can be uh, to um, keep patients symptom free and also keep our lungs healthy. So it's been shown that higher IgG trough levels may be of value in preserving lung function, even without any evidence of current infection. Now, one of the tools that we use it's a measurement called FEV1, and this measures how much forced air you can exhale uh, in one second. And this is a very common or very useful lung function tool. And they noted that the FEV1 increased linearly when the IgG trough level was maintained in a range of 800 to 1100. So there's a lot of data that we might be able to manipulate positive changes in lung health in patients that are receiving immunoglobulin replacement just by keeping trough levels elevated. So that's really um, infection. I'd like to talk about non-infection uh, causes uh, for these lung symptoms and how it impacts lung health. Well, this is a crude drawing that I did of the lung. So, Please don't use it for any accuracy, but I did want to show you how we think about different areas of the lung and how that could be causing new symptoms. So uh, in the structural changes, because we're not really talking about um, dynamics here or infections, we're talking about what happens in the lungs and how the lungs can change, like any tissue space can change. We can see changes in the airway, and I've circled it as um, the area demarked as B. Uh, the airway obviously extends all the way up to that single uh, airway, the trachea, which obviously comes to the mouth and the nose. And these airways connect and branch out to the smallest of smallest spaces and end in spaces that are these little circles called airspace or alveoli. So it's important for us to maintain this airway, keep everybody open. When we see these airways are narrowed, um, that would be a condition again like asthma, COPD, like fixed airway obstruction. Scarring can occur in the tissue space itself. Again, we see that as a form of either due to injury from infection Bronchiectasis, um, many patients are becoming familiar with bronchiectasis. It might be something that was picked up on an X-ray or a CT scan of the chest. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about bronchiectasis next and what that is and what that does to how you feel with your lungs and some complications that might occur. Some patients with some uh, uh, primary deficiencies might develop cysts in their lungs. And this can happen both in the lung tissue itself as a result of injury or connections of the air space. 
and the air spaces can open up and um, become empty spaces where there's really not a lot of air coming in and air coming out when you breathe. Inflammation can occur obviously anywhere in the lung as this is a very active space for the immune system. We think of asthma as mainly inflammation, narrowing of these air spaces and production of mucus uh, in the air space predominantly. Interstitial lung disease is usually going to be occurring as multiple small scars that occur in the lung tissue itself and granulomatous disease can occur inside the lung space where we see airways and outside in the tissue space. And then again, cancer can occur in any place in the lung, including the airways as well. So just thinking about structural changes in the lung, we've already talked a little bit about this. Um, so patients with PI, um, patients that cough, patients who've had recurrent um, bronchitis episodes, um, some of their issues might be due to a condition called tracheomalacia or bronchomalacia. This is a condition that can be caused by chronic coughing. And we know if you've had respiratory infections, coughing is a big part of it. It's how the lung removes a lot of that mucus. That mucus can be from an infection. It can be from inflammation. Unfortunately, these conditions cause more coughing. Uh, it's a very tricky condition, but quite easily to see on standard x-rays. A chest x-ray might even be able to pick up tracheomalacia. And for bronchiomalacia, um, that can be picked up on CT scans um, more readily than on a chest x-ray. We've already talked a lot about asthma. Asthma, fortunately, is thought to be reversible. Um, when we see, particularly in patients with PI, it's really interesting. A lot of people have looked at this. Patients with PI have concurrently diagnosis of asthma at very high rates. It's very interesting to me because I don't always know if that is uh, asthma like we would think about asthma in for, you know, in, in preschool children, or if you look at an elementary school and pick up all the kids that have asthma, or is it something very different in our PI patients? Um, I do think that it is a more blended phenotype, honestly. But we see it so very often in our PI patients. And that's why we have to be careful when we have patients that are coughing or have symptoms of bronchitis. Just make sure that they don't also have a component of asthma. We might be able to more readily control their symptoms and make them feel better faster if we make sure that there's not an inflammation component as well. Our goal, honestly, is always to minimize cough, um, particularly if it becomes a chronic symptom or a recurrent symptom, whether or not the patient is having infection. And fixed airway is really something more common that we would see with COPD or injuries such as um, the injury that happens in association with cigarette smoking. Scarring and fibrosis of lung tissue, um, same thing can be these um, conditions such as uh, interstitial lung disease or can be associated with particular injuries as well as due to infections. We can usually pick up scarring and fibrosis from CT scans of the chest we can, might be able to pick up some changes that make us suspicious that's what could be going on when we do breathing tests. Um, breathing tests, such as we talked about measuring that FEV1, there's some other features as well we measure as people are breathing maximal breaths in, maximal breaths out. We oftentimes can pick up if there are changes in those numbers that there could be some scarring and fibrosis. That oftentimes limits in, uh, someone's exercise tolerance um, if there are those changes in the lungs. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, where we are on this list now, which is bronchiectasis and cystic lesions. Now bronchiectasis is unfortunately another common uh, finding in patients with PI. Again, we see it commonly in uh, antibody deficiency patients, but we can certainly see bronchiectasis in other PIs as well. 
We see it with uh, combined immune deficiency almost just as frequently as we see it in conditions like CVID. Well, what is bronchiectasis? Bronchiectasis really refers to a specific type of damage that occurs in the airways. And this causes a section or sections of the airways to be dilated and stretched out. When this happens, the airways that are affected, they don't function like healthy airways. They're more prone to kind of collecting mucus. So you're letting gravity collect that mucus and you're not able to expel that mucus as easily with coughing or just the natural tissue of the airways usually moves that mucus up and out. In areas of bronchiectasis, that doesn't happen very efficiently. Symptoms are often cough or a cough that produces a lot of mucus. Um, if significant areas of the lung are affected with bronchiectasis, then many of these airspace pockets will be filled with mucus and the oxygen coming from the air we're breathing as it goes into those air spaces, it doesn't diffuse into our bloodstream as easily. And we can see some changes in how we can oxygenate our blood. That can limit us when we want to do activities like running or uh -oh, carrying a heavy laundry basket up and down steps, um, walking distances and walking on inclines. And so sometimes something as simple as bronchiectasis can be causing some changes in how we feel comfortable exercising. Bronchiectasis is picked up on x-rays as well, um, such as chest x-rays, also CT scans, and certainly by doing these breathing tests that I alluded to earlier, um, sometimes we can see those changes in the gas exchange and that can clue us in that there might be significance about bronchiectasis. Small amount or small sections of the lung affected by bronchiectasis are usually not very significant and usually do not cause a lot of problems for patients. Um, we wanna prevent uh, bronchiectasis. The best way to do that is to prevent infections as best as we can, as well as to prevent a lot of coughing. That's why I've talked a lot about coughing because we know it can cause some um, damage and we wanna prevent that. Um, cystic lesions are really rare. They occur in sp particular types of PI um, where there's been um, a lot of inflammation in that area there's an open um, lung space. Instead of these small little pockets of airspace, there'll be an open airspace that connects to, again, the air we're breathing in. We breathe in quite a bit of mold spores in our environment. Every time we're outdoors, we actually breathe in mold. Um, I would say fungus is among us. And um, in those areas that really don't mix well with air in and air out, it's kind of a little dead space of air, um, those fungal spores could actually uh, multiply, grow, and we can get um, pretty significant fungal infections in cystic spaces. Well, I wanted to move on to inflammation as a separate topic. Um, and inflammation that is um, associated with the airways, we spoke a lot about, that's our bronchiectasis and our asthma. But we see um, inflammation in the tissue space. That's really a condition where we think of interstitial lung disease. Now, interstitial lung disease and granulomatous disease, or the presence of granulomas in the lung, are very common in many um, PI disorders. Granulomas are most common in CVID, combined immune deficiency, and chronic granulomatous disease. And while commonly occur in the lung, there are many other sites where we develop, uh, we see patients develop granulomas as well, including lymph nodes, skin, GI tract, um, pretty much any uh, tissue space, there can be the presence of granulomas. Now granulomas are an interesting condition they result from an immune response that's sort of become very exaggerated. It's an immune response with particular cells of the immune system, usually brought on by exposure to something that is normally outside the body. So it certainly can be due to an infection. 
It can be due to a foreign object. Um, it can be due to a virus. This initial immune response gets set up usually by our cellular immune uh, immunity or a cellular immune system, monocytes and macrophages engaging with T cells. That's relevant to what I'm gonna be talking about for GLILD. So we need a way to um, take this exaggerated immune response um, and calm it back down again. Um, that's the best way. We really don't have a good understanding of what specifically causes granulomas in all of these PI. There's been some theories for particular infections, but it doesn't necessarily have to be brought on from the infection. Granulomas are thought to occur in up to 50% of patients with common variable immune deficiency. Well, in thinking about GLILD, uh, GLILD is uh, a very shortened form of a condition that's broken, what it's really called is granulomatous and lymphocytic interstitial lung disease. So this means that there's granulomas in the lung and there's also interstitial lung disease um, that is brought out by very active populations of lymphocytes. Now, it's thought that roughly 20 to 30 percent of patients with common variable immune deficiency do have a, some degree of GLILD. This might even be an underestimated, uh, um, I, uh, um, this may be an underestimate, I should say, because I don't really feel that patients are screened for GLILD. Um, we'll talk a little bit about screening and, and what we can do to um, pick this up better, but it's, it's, it may not be that easy to pick up. It, it's hard to pick up when the disease is very mild. The patients may have no symptoms whatsoever, that they have GLILD that might be picked up on a chest X-ray or a CT scan done for another condition. Now, it is considered pathognomonic of CVID. That means that if you uh, found to have GLILD, then the chances of, that you have CVID are very high. It, it seems to be something very unique to the defects we see in CVID. There are some risk factors for GLILD. This includes being female, uh, having female gender, uh, having a younger age diagnosis of their CVID, and then having uh, similar uh, findings that are maybe outside the lung, such as uh, a large spleen. Uh, we also, when looking at the um, B cells, which are the immune cell that makes the antibodies, there's a particular type of B cell called memory B cell. And when those are very low um, and the presence of splenomegaly uh, are very strong risk factors uh, for developing GLILD. And so that might be one way to screen, just understanding what um, our patients' risk factors are and if they have these risk factors, taking a look at the likelihood that they may develop GLILD. So how do we manage respiratory symptoms? Well, we spent quite a bit of time talking about uh, what to do for infections, you know, the pillars of antibiotics, immunoglobulin replacement if appropriate, and then really making sure that we know if there's any airway disease. When we're talking about structural um, changes in the lung, we're gonna wanna manage and optimize airway function. Um, so again, making sure that air that comes in finds its way out and that mucus can as well. So when we're treating uh, for our airway obstruction and bronchiectasis, uh, we oftentimes encourage airway clearance. Uh, we, we like to use inhaled medications and since it's inflammatory, using inhaled steroids can really, really be helpful. In more advanced cases where we see a lot of inflammation, such as interstitial lung disease and granulomatous disease, even granulomatous interstitial lung disease, we usually up the ante on our treatment. And this can be prednisone, imuran, rituxan, methotrexate. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So specifically for GLILD, the treatment has really changed as we learned more about 
of GLILD as we're treating more and more patients with GLILD. This could be a whole talk just in itself. Um, but uh, corticosteroids were used for a long time, and this would be prednisone or prednisolone or methylprednisolone. Um, but really, it's not a great idea to expose our PI patients to corticosteroids. Um, just due to the effects overall on the body. Um, so uh, we've experimented with other medications and roughly 10 years ago, there was this paper that said, well, we can use um, an agent that's thought of as chemotherapy called rituxan or rituximab. Combining that with other agents such as azathioprine has really shown to be an incredible therapy for patients with GLILD. It's a pretty heavy treatment and although um, we can manage patients really well with this combination without them lending themselves to more infections, uh, we're always looking for a better approach. And this is where um, a couple of investigators, you know, a lot of folks, this is a complicated condition, right? So a lot of us talk to each other about, you know, how things are going with our patients and what, what we've tried and we're always up for experimenting with, with different agents that might have uh, a role to prevent harm, but at the same time, get some efficacy. And that's how this idea to start the uh, medication with Babatisept came about. Um, the researchers at um, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, sorry, uh, and uh, really approached a number of investigators uh, throughout the US uh, and um, I'll talk a little bit about this um, trial with Abatacept and some of our early experience with Abatacept. But do know that there are treatment approaches for GLILD and have some really promising results. Now, I wanted to put this in here because if um, you are experiencing issues that are related to lung function or exercise tolerance, and you're wondering what else can be done. Um, I always like patients to know what to expect. Um, I think very often we use um, these pulmonary function tests or spirometry. Um, we might use them with the medicine called albuterol to open up the airways. That tells us a lot of information about your airway function and particularly lets us know if you're going to get in trouble with some of these issues with airway obstruction, should you have an infection or just with um, an injury or exposures or for reasons we can't explain. We like to get imaging. It does help us to figure out um, the, the picture that I did of the lung, areas of the lung that we need to focus on and if that could explain some respiratory symptoms or if you're high risk of developing GLILD and you have an antibody deficiency, then maybe we can pick up some early signs of that. I talked a lot about sputum cultures. It's really um, helpful to make sure you're treating the right thing. When we do exercise testing and bronchoscopy, that's usually more advanced testing. And usually if we need a, a more advanced diagnosis such as GLILD, it might even be because we can't figure out what infection patients have, or they can't really expectorate or cough up mucus for a good sputum sample. So sometimes bronchoscopy can be really valuable. And six minute walk testing or cardiopulmonary exercise testing is really valuable so that we understand if you have limited exercise tolerance, or where exactly that's coming from. And so these are some of the uh, testing that might be done. So um, I might have had these slides out of order, so I apologize, but um, this takes us back to that study that I was talking about for GLILD. I um, wanted to provide a little update about this study. So if there's anyone here in our audience that does have or has a concern for GLILD or has been diagnosed with GLILD, um, and there are some concerns about treatment options, um, uh, we at Duke, as well as um, obviously Cincinnati Children's Hospital, Beth Israel um, in California, at UC San Francisco, um, University of South Florida, and the Mayo Clinic are all partners in participating in this study. The lead investigators are at Cincinnati. Um, Dr. Jordan and Dr. Kellner are leading this research. 
um, to um, study the efficacy and the safety of a Batacept um, in our patients with common variable immune deficiency and GLILD. Very briefly, um, this medication has been used uh, for auto-inflammatory or autoimmune conditions and may have some uh, a specific role for GLILD and has some interesting um, uh, effect that we think would be quite applicable to our patients with GLILD. So adults and children are eligible to participate in this study. Um, study visits are both in person as well as over the phone, and the treatment will take place over one year. So I think that's um, uh, all I had to say about the study. Um, well, I realize we're getting close to top of the hour, so I just wanted to finish up with some summer, summary slides here. Um, and again, you know, it's always important for you to know what you can do. I talked a lot about our perspective. This is what you can do. Well, I think it's important to address symptoms early, particularly in patients with PI. There might be a lot of chronicity of symptoms. Um, you know your symptoms best, and we need to be aware of those symptoms. If there's a change in symptoms, there might be something we can do, or there might be a new condition that's developed. And so it doesn't always have to be the same issue every single time. It may feel like the same issue because symptoms can have a different etiology. So it's helpful to think about what else we can do to make sure we're treating things appropriately and we're doing the right diagnostic testing. There are frequent areas of confusion, when to start antibiotics, which one link course, um, when to repeat testing. Um, we like to keep people off of uh, oral steroids or prednisone. And so um, I hope I've addressed some of those points of confusion um, through this talk. I also mentioned some immune suppression medications. It's true we don't like prednisone, but there are other immune suppression medications that can be very helpful. A lot of PI can be an overactive immune system that's preventing normal immune function. So sometimes by tapering that down, we can get better immune function, and that is always a win. Well, um, that's it. Thank you, everyone, for, for listening, and um, I hope we can have some questions and continue talking further. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lugar. We are so excited to get into the Q&A next. Um, again, my name is Emma Mertens. I'm the Program Manager of Community Health at the Immune Deficiency Foundation. And tonight's presenter is Dr. Lugar from the Duke Asthma Allergy and Airway Center. Um, I know we have lots of questions queued up already, but if you have anything else you'd like to ask during the Q&A, friendly reminder to please enter it in the Q&A box on the control panel on your Zoom screen. Um, and I just want to give a quick disclaimer. Um, we have a lot of people on the call tonight, which is wonderful, um, but that also means that unfortunately we might not get to every single question, so we ask for you to be patient with us. Um, we want to, of course, be mindful with Dr. Lugar's time. We know it's after hours um, for her, so um, bear with us and we will get through as many questions as we can. All right, Dr. Lugar, first question. This individual wants to know, um, being diagnosed with asthma and CVID at the same time, how can complications such as worsening lung disease be prevented from progressing to more severe lung disease? And yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I love those questions. Um, I think that is an excellent question to talk to your immunologist about. So hopefully I've addressed a little bit about that. One of the best things that you can do is make sure that if there's any underlying lung disease or lung issues such as asthma, we know that that can set you up for infections outside of the uh, immune deficiency. We also know that some of that asthma, like I said, I'm always a little bit suspect, there's, there's probably some inflammation in the lung. So I think it's helpful to have breathing tests done to make sure that that airway obstruction is really reversible because that's how, that's what we think asthma really is. So get that optimized first and foremost. 
Uh, we also know that by treating infections early really, really help um, to prevent the infection, particularly if it's like a sinus infection, you know it's gonna go into your lungs, well then what's your go-to strategy? What are you gonna do when you first get a sinus infection so that we make sure it doesn't get into the lungs? The less infection in the lungs, the less coughing is the best way to preserve lung health. We don't know a lot about preventing um, interstitial lung disease, or GLLD, that's probably a bigger topic, um, but certainly how your lungs work and keeping your lungs healthy is optimizing that airway, those airway symptoms, and having a go-to plan when you first get sick so it doesn't lead to lower airway symptoms. Thank you. All right, next question. For patients that have PI, autoimmune disease, and autoinflammatory disease, how does one determine if it is an infectious process or an inflammatory process? Yeah, excellent question. You guys <laughs> must have been reading my mind when I was doing this talk. Yeah, because that's exactly, that, that's such a practical question because that's exactly what we're trying to figure out. Um, so it's kind of going through, you know, listening to those symptoms, uh, what are the features of those symptoms? We probably need some data. Culture data would be really helpful. Um, getting an x-ray might be helpful if, if appropriate. You know, sometimes we do spirometry. Um, we know that if it's going to be in inflammatory, we might have to do inhaled corticosteroids, for example. If you're already on inhaled corticosteroids, maybe we up those. We try to prevent going to oral steroids and usually we're pretty successful um, at just walking that fine line between getting the inflammation down. Um, if there's culture data, that's great. Um, we know certain bacteria are really hard to clear. So some approach for, it might be appropriate for some folks to do a longer course of antibiotics because the less we're seeing that bacteria, the less inflammation there's gonna be. It's really hand in hand. You can't 100% separate that out. Anytime there's infection, there's inflammation. Anytime there's inflammation, there's going to be altered immune function. You know, the immune system is too busy taking care of that stuff. It's gonna be distracted. So we have to kind of treat both together. And it's really helpful if we know if there's culture data because particularly in the lungs, that, that can really help us figure out, are we doing the right thing by doing this or that? And how long are we going to be doing this antibiotics? Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Our next question, this individual says, thank you for this excellent presentation. Do you usually check trough levels before the fourth IV dose and after about six to eight weeks after starting subcutaneous IgG? Thank you. Yeah, so um, it is important to have that that trough. I usually check a trough even, you know, when folks are on maintenance, usually every three months if we can, every three to six months, we, we like to have that data just so that we know. We know sometimes there's um, changes in our body that increase that catabolism of immunoglobulin. So we just like to make sure that folks are staying stable in that range that we've decided for them. For sub-Q, yes, it does take roughly six to 12 weeks to get to that stable level. When you're checking a trough, if someone is getting subcutaneous IG, really, I'm not, I don't really um, worry too much if they, if we get a level two days after their infusion or two days before their next infusion. I've just learned over the 20 years or so that it really doesn't change that much when patients are not missing doses and they're very stable on their sub-Q. Uh, troughs are very easy to get almost any time on sub-Q, particularly for folks doing it every week or every seven days. Thank you. All right, next question. This individual wants to know, what is the culture process and is it invasive? It's generally not invasive. Um, to get the best culture, you want to have the early morning uh, production of sputum. So most often that means that 
in the morning when you get up, you're just going to have a lot of settling of that mucus in the chest. And you can usually, you have a dry mouth usually. And so you're not going to get a lot of spit as contamination. You haven't been eating all day. You're not going to put some mouth cells in there, which eating and brushing your teeth can do. So first thing in the morning, when you first get up, coughing and putting that sample into a culture cup um, is really helpful. Close that up and you're gonna to wanna to bring it into your doctor's office. If you're not able to cough up anything, then sometimes we'll try to induce people to do some sputum or expectorate. Um, that can be done with doing a nebulizer with um, a salt solution or um, a little more invasive. And if we can't get it that way, then we have to go to bronchoscopy, which would be invasive. It's very similar to doing um, endoscopy of the stomach, but we do a form of endoscopy where a small camera is led into the airway, and then um, we can sample the fluid there and we can get a culture. But most times, just uh, coughing up early morning um, sputum is best. Your doctor should hopefully give you, if they're trying to track this, can give you specified sterile culture cups. And when you leave the office and you go home, whenever you can get that sample, you can then cough it into that specific cup. It just won't work if you try to give us a Tupperware container or a Dixie cup or in tissue those that's long gone and we won't be able to get any data from there. It's best to use those cups. Thank you. We have a couple of other questions about cultures that we'll get to in a minute. Um, this next question, how are the risks with numerous bronchial infections over many years for someone with a PI, specifically CVID? Yeah, um, well, that's what we worry about. Um, no, everyone is very individual. And sometimes we see folks that have had 20, 30 years before they're diagnosed, they've had multiple bouts of pneumonia and they have really good lung function and we don't see a lot of scarring. Um, that's not very often. Oftentimes we'll see some scarring, maybe some of this bronchiectasis. So the risk is, is there. Um, but everyone's very individual. Fortunately, through a CT scan or some of the other testing we've talked about tonight, you can determine exactly if there are any changes in your lungs. Thank you. All right, this next individual asks, my doctor avoids culture data, and this leads to long and difficult infections. Do you know if insurance companies cover cultures? I'm wondering why my doctor won't do culture samples. Yeah, well, obviously, I, I don't know the answer to that. But um, as far as I know, uh, cultures and culture data are not... Um, I haven't had any issues with high cost or um, refusal to pay um, with culture data. You know, it's very similar to doing a urine sample. You know, some, some doctors do urine samples as part of their specialty, whether it be certainly an OBGYN or if you're going to other doctor's offices. And so I've never really thought that that, was, that would be an obstacle. I think some that might be uh, an opportunity maybe to um, have, you know, your physician kind of learn maybe a little bit more about how culture data can be really helpful. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, this person wants to know, what type of test does one need to undergo in order to diagnose a respiratory infection? That's an excellent question because it's going to be different um, depending on what the symptoms are. Um, and and, and a, lot, a lot of people come to me with that same question. Um, we're not always able to find every case where we think there could be a respiratory infection. If, if you can, if, if there's coughing, then of course we're going to try to look at sputum cultures. If there are um, significant symptoms, then we can get a chest x-ray or CT scan. I don't get CT scans that often, so I don't mean to say that you always need to get a CT scan. 
Um, but if it's something that's been ongoing and lingering, and you really think there's an infection, you have to employ all of all of those tactics. I do think overall it's better for you to know whether or not this is an infection and not just to resort to antibiotics and maybe prednisone or sort of pulling medicines off the shelf. Obviously we have to do that from time to time, but if this is recurring and you're still struggling and you don't feel like you're getting on the right track, then I would say we have to go through all those steps that we talked about maybe imaging a culture, maybe even bronchoscopy, depending on your immune deficiency, might be the way to go if you're you know, really not able to get it, if you and your doctor are not able to get a good answer. Thank you. All right, this next individual shares, um, can non-resolving bronchiolitis, and they share in parentheses, they're positive for adolescent atelectasis and negative for interstitial lung disease and an adult be either inflammatory or infectious could coexisting non-systemic autoimmunity and or iron deficiency be fueling this um is my immunologist and pulmonologist both needing to be involved or does it complicate things yeah i definitely think the pulmonologist and the immunologist should have a conversation and that's and that's something that I've learned uh, over the years that sometimes the pulmonologist is doing a great job kind of, you know, treating what they, what they think they see, particularly if they think this is bronchiolitis, when there's a very specific sort of um, set of findings that you'll see with bronchiolitis and a treatment approach. And your um, immunologist might say, well, this is an inflammatory side effect of this particular, you know, immune deficiency, and I'm actually more worried about this, or this is something that could represent a chronic um, viral infection of the lung. And so conversation together, they can share why they, you know, why we think in our own field, this makes sense to us. So absolutely, um, pulmonologists and allergists, immunologists work well together. I, I encourage those conversations um, because they have a unique perspective. Um, I haven't heard of uh, atelectasis generally is not um, something that um, is associated with inflammation. It's usually associated with just lung expansion, which can be, you know, I always tell people not to be lazy breathers, but to take deep breaths. Those incentive spirometers you get in the hospital after surgery or whatnot, or I have an Amazon actually. When, when there's atelectasis, I often tell people to get it in some spirometer, use it in some spirometer. That's something we can easily um, manage. And it, it does improve exercise tolerance using that. Iron deficiency anemia, I'm not aware of how that would be specifically related to any of the conditions that you mentioned. Thank you. All right, this next question. What is the theory behind um, why having a higher IgG trough level has a positive impact on the FEV1? Is it because it prevents lung infections, which could lower FEV1? Or is there a different mechanism at play? Does this data hold up after a lung transplant? <laughs> That's an excellent question. So um, I think it's a combination of a couple of different things. I think there's it's definitely associated with reduction in infection. That is by far our strongest data point with higher trough levels. Um, and that you know, makes sense because you're really getting such a diverse amount of antibody. We don't know batch to batch, lot to lot, how much Haemophilus influenza IgG there is or Streptococcus pneumoniae IgG there is. And so obviously the more you have sort of available to you in your circulation, you know, you hope that's enough to get you to neutralize this infection. So I think it's probably a combination of both. We use immunoglobulin replacement in other conditions, such as rheumatologic diseases and neurologic diseases where there's inflammation or, uh, or auto-inflammation or autoimmunity. And so we also know that higher IgG or higher dose of IgG does give us some more of these um, immune modulating or immune regulating immunoglobulin that might be anti-inflammatory. So 
And that might be a smaller portion of that effect. I think the bigger portion is probably um, better reduction in infections, but it's probably a combination of both. Thank you, Dr. Lugar. All right, this individual says, I'm having such a hard time getting my doctors to agree to test what I'm coughing up. So another person, their doctor doesn't wanna do cultures. Even being at the doctor's office with 104 degree temps and progressive wet cough, they just refuse to take a culture. Do you have any advice? Uh, I'm really sorry to hear that. <laughs> I just talked about that a lot. Um, well, if it's an allergist immunologist, um, then I, I honestly think there's, there's quite a bit of data about this. And um, I might, you know, refer them say, you know, I might take the approach of, you know, this is, um, I would feel a lot better um, if we were able to use this or, you know, use, use this BM to see if there's something in there. It's, it's, it's important to me and, you know, you're, you're the person I'm going to, to, to help me. Um, I understand that it may not show anything. I understand it's going to be inconvenient, but this is what I need um, for, you know, for my health. I, I really want to get this done. If it's coming from an ear, nose, and throat doctor or a pulmonologist or a primary care doctor, then that's where talking with an immunologist would be helpful. There's also resources for um, docs to talk to other docs, um, you know, and get opinions. Um, the Quad AI has uh, an Ask the Expert question um, where, you know, if there are clinical conundrums that come up, um, there's uh, a free available way for, for folks to write in and get some get some advice. Um, I don't know what the specifics are, you know, that, that they feel it's just not going to be helpful. Um, but I would say just make an appeal that you, you, you know, you're very savvy about your health. You understand that this might be beneficial and you're hoping to get a few cultures before you throw it away as not helpful. Thank you. All right, this person asks, should post-infection inflammation or coughing be treated with prednisone? So it, it frequently is, and I would argue against that. Um, you know, it, a prednisone, it can be really great to manage that, although we find that a couple of times a year or more, even more than that, that adds up to a lot of prednisone exposure. Um, I usually have better luck with the inhaled steroids. And we just, if you're already on inhaled steroid, we increase the inhaled steroid. And that can help give you where you need it, just in the chest without getting that body-wide exposure to the prednisone. Um, and sometimes a combination of a bronchodilator and a steroid in a nebulizer machine, plus an inhaled steroid that's a handheld dose, can be enough to deliver the right amount of something to open the airways and something to, um, as an anti-inflammatory for the airways. And that can help. Oftentimes when you're sick, you're coughing, you're maybe not getting the best uh, dosing off your inhaler, that your, your handheld inhaler. And so you doing a nebulized treatment can, you know, if you're coughing through it or, or whatnot, it, you get more medicine into better distributed throughout the areas of the lung than when you're sick. Um, when your airways are narrow, you're just not dispersing it throughout the lung as much as, as you should be, and that's where a nebulizer can help. And oftentimes we find that's just as effective if started early than doing a course of prednisone. Thank you, Dr. Lugar. All right, next question. Let's see. Folks would like to know, how can I be a part of the clinical trial for Abatacept? Yeah, so um, so there's some information. Um, I think on that one slide, uh, if, if you'd be willing to share that with folks, they can log onto the website. And there's also, if anyone is in, uh, our area and would be willing to travel to participate. Um, you can let the organizers know. Maybe um, Emma, you can 
um, share that information and I'd be happy to get you in touch with our research coordinators to get involved. We're kind of dispersed a little bit throughout the US. So hopefully we can catch as many people as would be able to come. Yeah, sure thing. Um, if I can get that information from you, um, when we go to upload the recording of this webinar to our website and YouTube page, we can actually include information um, on how to participate in the listing and folks can find it that way. Great. All right, thank you, Dr. Lugar. Next question. Um, this individual asks, what is the incidence of new diagnoses of tracheobronchomalacia in CVID adult patients? Um, are there any specific treatments to improve or reduce it? So fortunately, it's pretty rare. Um, tracheomalacia and bronchomalacia are um, overall pretty rare conditions. Um, it, it you know might be a little more common in certain patients with combined immune deficiencies, um, but overall it's pretty rare. Once it is present, like once you have it, um, it's it really it's not something that we can reverse with any medical intervention. Um, there are some things that we can do to stabilize the airway, almost like putting in a stent. And so, you know, I've never had to do that. Um, and so it's, it's, it's quite unlikely um, that 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 would be an issue. Uh, it has to be very, very long standing and very poorly managed. And honestly, it's cough that causes cough. It, it's a whole coughing cycle. And so um, the only time anyone would intervene is if um, it was affecting how you breathe. So it has to be quite severe. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, what is the ideal treatment of bronchiectasis? The ideal treatment, it's gonna vary a little bit person to person, but it really focuses on airway clearing. And so because there's a small inflammatory component, you wanna make sure that that is part of the treatment regimen. And that could be with enhanced steroids, but not necessarily for everybody. You wanna have something that opens the airways and you want to be able to clear any mucus from the airways. So depending on where the bronchitis is located and, and how extensive it is, this might involve using inhalers or using a nebulizer, um, clearing that um, with expectorating mucus. There might be some positional uh, exercises you can do to help drain that mucus, as well as little devices called acapella valves, or other uh, mucus clearing devices where you breathe in those and it sends a little vibration down the airway and that loosens up any sticky mucus, again, for you to cough up. Um, that's really, um, you know, that people can wear a, a vest that vibrates as well. Um, but really the, the uh, mucus clearing devices, the inhaled medications to keep the airways open, and expectoration, usually first thing in the morning, um, tries to get as much as that mucus, as much of that mucus up as, as possible. And that's the best approach for um, bronchiectasis. Thank you. Um, all right, this next individual asks, what is the best way to reduce inflammation in a person with tracheomalacia and L main stem bronchiomalacia when they get bronchitis and are left with a cough that lasts for weeks? Oh gosh, yeah, that sounds a little bit tricky. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess it would depend a little bit on how and how bad that tracheomalacia is. I, I think there might be more people with tracheomalacia than, than I realize in this group, but um yeah, so honestly, it's it's very much focused on that cough you're talking about, getting that cough to go away as, as, as fast as possible, which is really, really difficult to do. Um, but that's, you're, we're probably gonna be using those um, anti-inflammatory medications. Um, nebulizer medications might be effective, uh, making sure that there's no thrush, you know, because anytime we see that the airway is, um, you know, uh, um, larger or, or baggier than it should be, um, we don't, that there's turbulence in the airway and air swirls around. And so sometimes people just get antibiotic courses and then they get a yeast infection of the upper airway. 
So, you know, making sure that that's not there. Folks would cough if they have that too. So kind of keeping track of uh, keeping the airway uh, clear is the best way to get that cough under control. Using um, uh, medications that are anti-inflammatory like inhaled steroids, and then working with like a speech um, uh, pathologist or speech therapist. Um, some ear, nose and throat physicians have a separate area like we do at Duke that focuses on voice and um, cough, vocal cord dysfunction, and a lot of upper airway issues. They can teach you how to uh, try to contract or use the muscles uh, in the upper airway when there's a coughing fit. And that can sometimes break cough cycles. So a little bit of physical therapy for the voice, anti-inflammatory to make sure that whatever's triggering the cough can be alleviated, making sure there's not secondary infections, such as um, yeast infections of the upper airway that can kind of continue a cough, particularly if you've been on a course of antibiotics. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, were any of the study participants so far people who had both a primary immune deficiency and an autoimmune disease, such as lupus or relapsing polychondritis? If so, did their results differ from those of the majority of study patients? Excellent question. And, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of folks that have CVID and will have GLILD, um, often will have an autoimmune disease as well. Um, and that could be anything. So yes, uh, we've had um, a few patients. I mean, we don't have hundreds of patients that we've treated. We've, we've got you know, a handful of patients that we've treated inside the study. Um, these patients are mainly outside of the study. And that's what sort of enforced us to go ahead and try the study. So yes, those patients have had autoimmune disease such as auto uh, uh, inflammatory uh, arthritis or arthritis, um, uh, very similar to conditions that you mentioned, as well as, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I'll just say yes. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, uh, point to anyone specifically, but absolutely. And you know, since the auto inflammation is. Um, and the GLILD, they're both inflammatory conditions. The root of what's causing this inflammation is oftentimes quite similar. So the efficacy is equal. And we see that the auto-inflammatory condition, as well as what we're trying to treat for GLILD, is also treated at the same time. Uh, in that, um, you know, there's no selection that it's only going to affect one organ system or the other it has an impact overall on immune inflammation. Thank you. Um, and folks, we are trying to figure out how to um, share the link to the clinical trial participation um, in the chat. Just give us just a few and we'll, we'll get that in there so you guys can check that out here as well. All right, thank you, Dr. Lugar. Next question. Um, do patients with CVID who have had to have a splenectomy due to abdominal trauma um, have an increased risk of CGLID relative to those with intact spleens? Good question. Um, not that I uh, could say from an observation standpoint. Um, I have many patients with GLILD uh, currently in my care, and quite a handful have had a splenectomy before they even met me uh, for usually either hypersplenism, which means the spleen is large and is overactive and contributing to anemia or low platelets. Um, and there does not appear to be any association with them later developing GLILD. In fact, it's, it's the process by which they needed to have their spleen removed that is a risk factor for the same immune aberrations that lead then to GLILD. Thank you. And yep, it looks like my co-host Megan was just able to share the um, clinicaltrials.gov link in the chat. So everyone um, should have access to that and be able to check that out if they like. All right. Do we have time for a couple more, Dr. Lugar? Yes. Okay. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, all right. This individual says, thank you for your time tonight. Other than general healthy lifestyle factors, can you briefly go over proactive healthy habits that have shown efficacy at generating healthy lung tissue and or preventing decline from systemic repeat infections? Yeah, so um, I agree with the healthy lifestyle changes. Absolutely. Um, exercise is good at sleep and stress reduction. Probably more exercise, honestly. Um, yoga practicing good breathing. You know, I think that exercise is really great because it recruits other areas of the lung that we don't use when we're sitting um, or when we're just doing short walks and short bursts. So exercise that really gets you to draw that air in and out is great. It prevents atelectasis, which is what we don't want. We want to keep all the areas of our lung exercised and open as much as possible. That type of deep breathing when we exercise helps to clear the airways of mucus as well. And it, it keeps our um, the connection between areas of the lung that receive oxygen and our blood vessels. They stay matched because it's like, hey, this part of the lung is opening up a lot. So I'm going to bring my blood supply here. When your body knows that you're not breathing deeply and there's pockets in your lung you're not opening, it doesn't even send blood there. And so in order to um, keep the, you know, cycling through the junk, the dead cell, just to keep the, the, the lungs healthy, exercise is really important because it's where you're going to see your blood supply. And that's what we want, to have, to have healthy lungs. So exercise is, is really help, help, helpful. Um, there are other things that, that I think we should be more aware of, just environmental exposures. Um, you know, getting outdoors is really helpful. We have to be careful for some patients with certain PIs, particularly this time of year or around dirt. Um, you know, you might wanna wear masks just to avoid those fungal spores. Um, anything that we do where we're exposed to like off-gassing of man-made materials, I really think that's important. We're learning more and more and more about exposure to diesel, exposure to certain indoor and outdoor environmental um, chemicals that are that are that are harmful. And you know, so not smoking, not vaping, um, being careful around your indoor environment. You know, I'm not going to go into the candle story because I don't know. You know, I think it's okay to burn a candle once in a while, but it does release a lot of these um, volatile compounds in the air that everyone's uniquely susceptible to. Some people might have more issues around those exposures than than other folks. So clean indoor environment, um, get outdoors, uh, be careful around um you know, certain exposures to dirt or, you know, just reducing our exposure to fungal spores um, and getting that exercise. And if you cannot exercise because of a variety of other things that are going on, you know, something that will increase your heart rate. I really do like um, having folks get an incentive spirometer. Uh, I, you know, I've had some patients say that they really feel like that, that makes a difference. They're really cheap. They're easy to use. A lot of hospitals give them away. Don't go to the hospital to get one. Obviously, Amazon has them. Um, and it exercises your lungs and basically smacks open those areas of lungs that, uh, that we're not um, able to use with more intensive exercise. And so I think that that's something that you can do, uh, even if you've had a period of time where you are, you know, sitting around the house or maybe you're caring for um, someone in your home and you can't do the things that you would normally do, like walking back and forth in the parking lot. Um, if you can take the stairs, um, that short burst really gets those, um, the heart pumping and those lungs open. So exercise is great. And when you can't, an incentive spirometer, be careful about your indoor environment, outdoor environment, and try not to put anything you're directly inhaling like vaping or cigarette smoke. Thank you. All right, we're going to end on this last question, and then we'll we'll let you go for the evening, doc, Dr. Lugar. Um, <clears throat> this individual says, on um, one of the early slides, you talked about various types of infections and types of mutations associated with those disorders. Um, what are your thoughts on genetic testing for patients with PI? Do you have any suggestions on how to go about that? 
Yeah, so um, we've really made a real change in how we think about PI. Genetic testing is a lot easier for us to offer to our patients. It used to be very difficult to do and um, expensive. And um, a, a, well, genetic testing is available. Um, not You don't have to be like a Duke, like anyone can order genetic testing. Um, Invite, for example, has a genetic testing. They're out of pocket if your insurance doesn't cover it. It's like $250. Um, they do offer a genetic counselor as well that if you were to get some findings back and you and your physician had some questions about interpretation of these results, um, then you can meet with a genetic counselor through Invite. Um, I think we are, we've learned a lot from genetic testing over the last five years. Um, we now can pick up specific genetic disorders and specific therapeutic options. We didn't have a chance to get into that, obviously, but um, some, some genetics are directly tied to certain medications, including abatacept. Abatacept might work extremely well in patients with CVID and one particular genetic mutation. So we're going to have more and more of these stories, more and more um, understanding we have in the more genetic tests we do. The, our professional society, um, the Quad AI or the American, Acad or the American Academy of Asthma Allergy and Immunology are recommending that in general, um, patients with a validated primary immune deficiency uh, have genetic testing done. Uh, and this is again, is because it helps us uh, with some prognosis for patients, as well as also helps us think about specific therapeutic options if applicable. So I am pro getting genetics done. I think it's relatively easy to get done um, through your physician. Uh, they can order through in vitae. Um, the cost might be covered by your insurance. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield can be a little difficult. Some federal plans can be a little bit difficult, but if you had to, it would be 250 out of pocket, which is significantly uh, less expensive than years ago. And I think most folks are actually using that company. So they have a validated data set um, that they're comparing these um, results to, and they do offer genetic counseling. Wonderful, thank you. And I, I also just shared um, one of our Immune Deficiency Foundation resources on genetic testing. We have a lot of information on our website if um, anyone in the audience would like to check that out. Um, but that's going to wrap up our Q&A for the webinar this evening. Um, thank you so much to our audience for your participation and your engagement. You guys asked some really great questions. Um, and thank you so, so much again to Dr. Lugar for sharing your time and your evening with us and um, giving us these updates and sharing your expertise. We are so grateful. Um, and we know it's been a long day for you. We know you had clinic and it's after hours. So, so we'll go ahead and let you go um, while we wrap up these last couple of slides for the webinar, but thank you so, so much. Well, thank you everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks, Dr. Lugar. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, just a couple more slides to get through and then we'll wrap things up for the webinar. All right, so if your question was not addressed during the program, go online and submit your question to Ask IDF. Visit www.primaryimmune.org slash ask-idf, or you can also give us a call at that 800 number on your screen. Um, we have a wonderful resource navigator who will personally connect with you to answer your question or to direct you to appropriate resources, so please feel free to reach out. You can also check out our resource center, support services, and YouTube page to find more videos and resources. It's a busy fall here at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and we hope to see you at one of our many upcoming programs. <coughs> Excuse me. Our next Lunch and Learn will be on November 8th, covering ataxia telangiectasia. And we have two more webinars this year. One will be covering mast cell activation disorder, and the other will be talking about COVID's impact on the PI community. Visit the link at the bottom of your screen to register and learn more. Finally, we hope you will save the date for our 2024 PI conference, which we will be hosting in person at the Sheridan Grand 
Riverwalk Chicago from June 20th to 22nd. We'd like to thank our wonderful sponsors again for their generous support of our programming here at the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Thank you everyone for your participation this evening and thank you again to Dr. Lugar. We hope to see you at another event this fall. Take care and have a great rest of your evening.